you know, this, um, it took place just a few days before uh, David got sick. And uh, at the time, I couldn't tell at all that this was coming. And uh, he was really quick, smart, impressive in, in a lot of ways. And uh, I remember sitting in his living room, very small living room, uh, and um, just trying to, you know, stay, in the, stay on the back of the wild tiger as he kept moving, you know, through the interview. Uh, and I hope you get a, a sense of that quickness and intensity from, from this. Chris was complaining today about how he was fetching a lot, and I, I thought that was really charming, actually. <laughs> so, this is me. Um, one of the things you say in your article about Cravel, you talk about his honesty, the type of writing he does. Honesty of that order actually threatens order. David, yeah. <laughs> me. I was wondering if you want to talk a little about that. <laughs> Yes. Whenever a person makes a breakthrough into honesty, that means self-knowledge and knowledge of what others can't see to, can't see to. To be honest in a real, absolute way is almost to be prophetic. And if you can be prophetic, and not too many can be for a very long time uh, in their lives, but if at least that prophetic note is struck a few times, then it's gonna upset the apple cart. But if at least it's gonna upset the apple cart, and if that apple cart is not upset, then conscious life just can't go on. It has to upset. And it has to be upset by things like, like I have in that Hilderman essay, something like the centaurs, the centaurs coming out of the cloud. They create the mountain streams, and the mountain streams tear everything up in their wake. And they're equivalent to these guys in the Roman bacchanalia that run through the street chasing women and doing things, doing this and that. But they're kings for the day. They're able to get away without breaking the regular laws. And drunkenness, lechery, crazy behavior is tolerated for that day. And a kind of crazy anarchy rules. This injection of irrationality and craziness and disorder into the ordered life is what regenerates life in general. Because Without it, we're going to get a, hysteric, a hierarchically ordered system, such as many years in ancient Egypt and among the Mayas and so on. I think it could come very easily to us here, and probably will, IBM and all those great uniform institutions. And I think that a very important part of what the poet is supposed to be doing is upset the apple cart. Because, after all, the apple car, after all, the apple cart is just an endless stream of indigestible meals and social commitments that are useless and probably shouldn't even be honored, and futile, pointless conversations and gestures, and finally, to die abandoned and treated like a piece of garbage by people in white coats <laughs> who are no more civilized or conscientious than the garbage, the sanitation workers, I think. That's what the apple cart means to me. And when, the poet, when a poet's voice, a poet's imagination, is able to touch people enough so that they will change that, of course it's upsetting the apple cart. What is, it that, what is it that it does? I think that poetry has a real kind of, I wouldn't say preachy kind of function, but it definitely is there to support and encourage people that there's a worthwhile life out there to be lived. A way of living is there, that all you have to do is invent it. It's available to all of us. Me. When you say a worthwhile life, and when Pat Robertson says <laughs> a worthwhile life, you're talking about two very different things. Would Artaud have been talking about a worthwhile life? David. Oh yes, he would have said a life that is free. He would have said without any organs. <laughs> a body that didn't have organs, meaning that all those biological imperatives, something, somebody like Artaud after he'd been sick with cancer long enough, he was dreaming of a way to live that was pure and free and enlightened. And I think I can relate to that. I called it in my book, 
when I was talking about cutting off bonds, cutting loose from those kinds of bonds, I quoted the poet Albers von Flauton, if I'm now mispronouncing, whose diary of 1822 sums it up in just a rhyming quatrain. To taste nothing but the flesh of light, forever whole and sweet, to drink of waters that refresh, but never drive the blood to heat. And I think that kind of life is really there. It just has to be invented, me. And so the purpose of poetry, David, is to help people invent their lives through language, me. And at the same time, to subvert all that keeps one from living a real life, David. Yes, exactly. Even sometimes in a destructive way. I certainly don't think that the lesson in living that you can get from reading certain kinds of literature, including many pages in William Burroughs and Jean Genet, I don't think that they're really all that edifying in a constructive way, <laughs> but they help destroy. They help to break it down. I remember the Marquis de Sade saying to someone, and of course he was always constructing these little imaginary debates, and he said to this imaginary opponent, you build, you're always building. I destroy, I simplify. And many of those corrosive pages of the great underground classics help to destroy. They're not very edifying or uplifting. They are good for people because they help to destroy something that needs to be destroyed, that needs to be subverted. Me. Do you think there's more that needs to be destroyed now than 30 years ago? David. Oh, no doubt. 